Welcome to Improving ILD Diagnosis in a Multidisciplinary Team Discussion Incorporating a Genomic Classifier. We are joined today by our sponsors from Verisight. A moderator for today's event is Dr. William Bowman. Dr. Bowman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I do want to welcome all our participants uh, in this ATS webinar. Uh, I'm uh, Bill Bullman. I am a pulmonologist who is currently serving as the medical director for pulmonology for Verisite. Uh, we are joined today uh, by two uh, uh, inter uh, international experts in interstitial lung disease. Uh, I'll introduce them in one moment. Our learning objectives for this session today are to first provide an overview of the ILD multidisciplinary discussion at the National Jewish Health. Um, to understand how the Invisia genomic classifier works in the diagnostic workflow for uh, certain ILD patients. And then Dr. Keith and Dr. Koslow are going to review some uh, interesting cases. Um, so that brings me to our, our speakers today. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Keith is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine uh, in, uh, as part of the interstitial lung disease program at National Jewish in Denver. Uh, and she's joined today by uh, Matthew Koslow, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at, uh, at National Jewish. So uh, I want to thank both of them for participating, and I hope you all uh, enjoy the session. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So we're going to start talking about the multidisciplinary team discussion. And so, Rebecca, this, this is a really important slide, isn't it? Because this has become a real staple in our, our field. And it's actually recommended by the ATS guidelines as the preferred standard for diagnostic decision-making. And the reason for that is because of all the evidence that's come from several studies, including improving diagnostic confidence, inter-observer agreement among team discussions, potentially changing management when these cases are discussed, and facilitating early and more appropriate referrals, such as the pulmonary rehab and transplant evaluations. And on the right, it's just a schematic of what's involved in the multidisciplinary team discussion. Now, even though these are recommended by guidelines, the guidelines also recommend the potential downside of an MDD, which is increased time and resource utilization. We see here that it's involving all sorts of specialists between the pulmonologists, radiologists, pathologists, subspecialists, advanced practitioners, and there was some discussion about what it really entails. The ITS guidelines settle on, at a minimum, it should really be a discussion between the pulmonologist, the radiologist, the pathologist when PATH is available. It doesn't really specify how this had ha should happen. But it does recognize that this could happen and there's no right way to do this. So here at National Jewish, the way we do it, um, this is a picture on the left of our group and you see some of the members that are here. Uh, we see our Dr. Young, we see me behind her. We see a thoracic radiologist, our renowned radiologist, Dr. David Lynch, and then Dr. Moaning, Dr. Fernandez, uh, visiting uh, uh, ILD specialists. And then in the screen behind, we have our pathologists, Dr. Hosani and Dr. Groshong, and other members of our team, Dr. Co uh, Corey Fratelli and Dr. Akuli. So since COVID, and Zoom, it really allows us to involve more members of our team. What are we doing? So we're typically discussing new cases and uh, typically a probable UIP indeterminate or an alternative case. And then we're also discussing those with a di diagnostic dilemma or a therapeutic dilemma. How are we doing this? We have a high volume, so we try to get organized. We send out a weekly email rem reminder to facilitate or to allow preparation by our colleagues and also invite some subspecialists when it's relevant, particularly rheumatologists, uh, sometimes immunologists or neurologists. And then during the discussion, we work through these gu guidelines that you see on the right. The most important thing is when we get to this discussion, we're trying to arrive at a consensus diagnosis and also a confidence level because we're trying to get that key question. Do we need more information? And how is that going to change management? Rebecca, you've been to other centers. Obviously, there's not one way to do this. How have you seen other centers successfully do this, perhaps with not all the resources that we fortunately have at uh, Tertiary Care Center? Yeah, so, you know, at, 
at National Jewish and many other tertiary care centers, we have this wealth of um, different subspecialists, our thoracic radiologists are right there. So it's relatively easy and a low bar for us to get together. But when I visit uh, my colleagues in the community or at smaller centers, it's often hard to get all of these people together. Um, and sometimes they struggle to be able to sit down in a room to discuss cases. But I think what you're talking about here is it's really collaborative care, that having a discussion about a patient case, and ideally you can be together, but sometimes you have to pick up the phone and have a conversation with your thoracic radiologist or then have a, or your radiologist or have a discussion then with your rheumatologist and kind of do it in an iterative way if you can't all get together. Because the important thing is to discuss the case, kind of put your heads together and make sure that you're making choices about what to do next to move the diagnosis for the, forward or to um, come to a consensus about treatment. Uh, so that's kind of what I've seen out in the community. And when we come to this discussion and thinking about whether we need more information, this is the role where a genomic classifier may come to discussion. So let's learn more about that from, from Bill. Yeah, thank you. Um, the uh, genomic classifier for UIP takes transbronchial biopsy specimens in patients uh, who have uh, a suspected interstitial lung disease, but who do not have a typical or definite UIP on imaging. Um, the test itself employs uh, RNA whole transcriptome sequencing from these old transbronchial biopsy samples. It's three to five uh, from the upper lobe and lower lobe on one side. Um, those uh, pooled specimens go through uh, whole transcriptome sequencing, and that data is uh, run through a computer algorithm uh, and it reports out a result of either genomic UIP positive or genomic UIP negative. The, uh, the test performance has been studied in uh, multiple uh, validation cohorts. Uh, the test was designed very purposefully to have high specificity so that you would have a high level confidence when it reports genomic UIP. That specificity uh, in the first validation cohort is shown in the, um, the gray bars, sorry, sensitivity and specificity are shown in the gray bars in the first validation cohort, uh, in the lavender bars, that's a separate second validation cohort, and in the dark purple bars, that's the specificity and sensitivity uh, from them combined. And what you see in uh, these, three, uh, these three bars is very consistent high specificity uh, across those cohorts and very consistent uh, somewhat more modest uh, sensitivity. Sensitivity uh, for the uh, aggregate uh, was 63%, which does mean that there are some patients with UIP who are not going to be detected by the, uh, by the classifier. Roughly one third of patients with UIP will get a negative result. And that's uh, a very important um, thing to remember when you're evaluating a particular result in the contact clinical context. So um, Dr. Keith, uh, how do you approach a positive result and a negative result in the context of these uh, sensitivity and specificity figures? Yeah, I, th I think when I get a positive result based on the specificity, I feel pretty confident that this is going to be a UIP diagnosis if we went to a surgical lung biopsy. But I think it's a little trickier given the sensitivity if you have a negative result. Um, Right, and, and these are generally patients who have either indeterminate um, imaging. And so if you have a negative result, but your um, clinical suspicion is still pretty high, then that's somebody you wanna talk about in multidisciplinary conference again, and even consider in the right clinical context to go further and investigate with surgical lung biopsy. Because the reality is, if you have a negative test, like in, for a negative for UIP, it still could be UIP. And sometimes it's important to know that, but it's definitely worth a discussion in multidisciplinary conference. Do you agree, Matt, or do you have different thoughts? Oh, I think, <clears throat> yeah, that's well said. Okay. So um, the... Uh, Sensitivity of the test when used in combination with HRCT um, uh, is uh, shown in uh, the data from a study published by uh, Luca Ricaldi out of Italy. Um, they uh, looked at uh, the genomic classifier result when used in conjunction with local radiology, what the uh, local radiologist uh, called on CT, 
And uh, it showed that the uh, sensitivity, first of all, uh, CT alone, HRCT alone, uh, is quite poor, uh, right? So there's a, uh, a very significant uh, false negative rate uh, with uh, CT alone. The genomic classifier has the 63% sensitivity uh, that we mentioned in the prior slide. When you combine HRCT and the genomic classifier, those two data points, um, the combined sensitivity for using those uh, in a, uh, a combined way is uh, as high as 79%. And uh, that is, I think, uh, a very important uh, thing to use um, uh, or to think about when you're uh, discussing these patients in multidisciplinary discussion. I would agree. I think that that graph kind of mirrors my own comfort level. Like if I have a CT, but then a CT plus a genomic classifier in the right clinical setting makes me feel more confident, especially in after discussion and multidisciplinary conference. The final thing to mention about the genomic classifier, this is um, data that was uh, presented uh, at uh, CHESS last year, I believe, and uh, again, at uh, partially, partially presented at ERS last year as well. Um, this was an analysis of 135 patients that were in the original development study uh, for the classifiers, a study called BRAVE. There were three parts. Um, and in a certain subset of the BRAVE cohort, there were patients who had longitudinal FVC data. So uh, we were able to take a look at how patients who were labeled genomically positive for UIP did in terms of FVC decline compared to those patients who are genomically UIP negative. So uh, the uh, median change uh, from baseline FVC, uh, sorry, the median baseline FVC in the genomic negative patients was uh, somewhat higher, uh, genomic UIP negative, 75 compared to 64%. That was a statistically significant difference. Um, the median follow-up FVC, however, um, uh, went down uh, significantly in um, the patients who are genomic UIP positive. Um, the median absolute change in patients who are UIP negative uh, based on the classifier result was actually a, a positive change of one compared to a negative change of three, three lost uh, percent uh, predicted points. Uh, and that was a statistically significant finding. So it does look like the genomic classifier uh, can uh, serve as a potential biomarker, at least in some patients, uh, for FVC decline over time. It's important to mention that in the BRAVE study, uh, most of the patients were collected prior to antifibrotic use. Uh, it's also important to mention that uh, the, uh, for the most part, the MDs participating as investigators in the BRAVE study were not given the Invisia classifier results. So uh, whatever happened in the 12 months uh, afterward uh, were generally not uh, affected by the use of antifibrotics. Obviously, with antifibrotics, you would expect uh, perhaps some slowing of that FVC decline over time. So okay. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Koslow, uh, who will um, go through how uh, these, uh, these this type of testing can be used in an individual patient workup. Okay, thanks, Bill. That's really informative. And we're going to try to get to our cases. Here's the graph again. And as we discussed, when we have a challenging case that may or may not need more information, especially those involving a procedure, an invasive procedure, this is the point where we start to discuss the potential role of a genomic classifier. And we're gonna illustrate this a little bit, little bit more clearly with some cases. So we're gonna move on to our first case. So this is a 72 year old male. Uh, we are in Colorado. So he, he was the typical Colora Coloradian, I don't know if that's a word, but who enjoyed sports in all seasons, very, very active and skiing in the wintertime, hiking and cycling in the summertime. He was a retired botanist and he developed symptoms that brought him to his primary care that led to a cardiac workup. And that involved the cardiac CT, which detected an abnormal lung value of uh, lung windows and, and that brought him to a referral at our ILD Center at National Jewish. So his history on review systems, he, in addition to the exertional dyspnea and fatigue, complained of cold hands, but he didn't complain of the typical color change that would be typical for Raynaud's. His history is significant for some mild gastroesophageal reflux disease, sleep apnea, which was treated, mild asthma, which was 
uh, treated and relatively controlled. He was a lifelong non-smoker. During some of these hikes that he would do, he would use a down uh, sleeping bag. He was a retired wildlife botanist. On physical exam, he had a normal resting saturation and by basal or inspiratory crackles, but no other stigmata of autoimmune disease, scleroderma, or uh, arthritis. His lung functions, his spirometry showed a normal spirometry without airflow obstruction, normal diffusion capacity, a normal lung volume, which is not shown here. On exercise oximetry, he decided from a 96 to a nadir of 91, and that was repeated with a forehead probe that showed a similar result. Before his referral, he had an exercise stress echocardiogram, which was unremarkable, no inducible ischemia, no signs of pulmonary hypertension, and no intracardiac cardiac shunting per agitated saline. We did follow this up with a cardiopulmonary exercise test, which demonstrated a normal predicted exercise tolerance. However, again, re-demonstrated this exercise desaturation. In clinic, we do have the fortune of working very closely with our rheumatologist. And because of this complaint of cold hands, he had a nail fold capillaroscopy, which was normal. This is just a image from a New England Journal review that shows how the torturous picture can look in uh, figure D and the normal in, in C. And other labs, CBC, chemistry, uh, muscle enzymes, and other than an ANA, which was pretty much normal, other serologies, including a comprehensive panel for scleroderma were all negative. And here's his CAT scan. On the left is a, as a movie, an axial movie, and on the right is the coronal image. We'll scroll through this movie, which should work. There we go. So besides of that granuloma, now we see, so I cannot stop that. But what we see is, I'm gonna play it again. As we're going cranially, caudally, we start to see this subpleural peripheral reticulation. At the bottom right, there was perhaps some traction bronchiectasis. And in the coronal, we can see the distribution again, where the upper lung windows are relatively uh, not involved. We see mostly the disease involvement in the peripheral and subpleural areas of the basal or lung zones. Other Notable features was perhaps a call of traction bronchiectasis at the right lower lobe. Also notable was faint central lobular nodularity in the right upper lobe. There was no mosaicism and on expiratory imaging, no significant air trapping. And it's important to comment that there was, no, there was persistence of these findings on the prone imaging, which is not included here. So in summary, we have a 70 year old male, lifelong non-smoker, with new symptoms, potential exposure with this down sleeping bag, especially if we're paying attention to that central lobular nodularity. Besides the cold hands, his workup was unremarkable for a connective tissue disease. And this is the kind of case where we might bring to multidisciplinary discussion. We'll start from the top. You know, could he have IPF? Well, we know that IPF is increased, has increased likelihood in older individuals. We consider alternative diagnoses, perhaps hypersensitivity pneumonitis, given his exposure and this central lobular nodularity. We look at the chest CT, and the way this was read was it could be probable UIP, but it didn't have the classic cranial caudal progression, and it was fairly mild. So ultimately, we call this an indeterminate for UIP pattern. So Matt, it, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm really struck by you know, here's a really active guy, but um, his disease does seem pretty mild, right? There's not a lot of imaging changes and his FBC is relatively well preserved. I mean, I guess the most salient thing is he does desaturate with ambulation, right? And, and for someone who's active at higher altitudes, that's important. Yeah. And I think that was really concerning his nuance and symptoms, the, the impairment. And that was not really well explained by another physiologic explanation. So this is something we would bring to discussion, and we're going to throw it back to our audience and see what they might think with these options.
All right, uh, looks like um, we have uh, a majority uh, have picked uh, bronchoscopy for BAL and genomic classifier at 73%. 18% uh, uh, selected a surgical lung biopsy uh, and 9% uh, uh, suggested uh, repeat PFTs in three months. All right, Matt, what do you think about that? Yeah, um, I think that there are, it's reasonable to consider many of these possibilities. So as you pointed out, this is, it's has very mild lung disease. The three month B is typically how we would follow our patients. So I think that's not unreasonable. I think B, which it sounds like no one chose, probably would be too much time to, to and I don't know if that's the way we would want to follow him. Surgical lung biopsy is certainly reasonable. I think the one comment that I would make here is that there is a considerable amount of morbidity and mortality with surgical lung biopsy, particularly in the patients that end up having UIP. So although that's not a wrong decision, particularly, and especially its role is in indeterminate cases like this, but the, I think the role for the bronchoscopy, particularly with the genomic classifier, is given his age, given this probable UIP that's perhaps not probable because it's too early, if you did have a genomic classifier that was consistent with UIP, that might be enough to manage. And that might depend on the comfort level of the clinician and the patient, but it's something that I would probably opt for because it may preclude the need for a surgical lung biopsy, depending on the clinical setting and the preference of the patient. I think, it, Matt, it's also important to point out that um... You know, the biggest thing in your differential when you're discussing this is actually hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is point. an airway centered disease. And often alveolar lavage and even transbronchial biopsies can be helpful in the diagnosis, particularly of HP. And so this may be someone after multidisciplinary discussion that you may consider going to bronchoscopy um, earlier because you have that nodularity on your CT and you might wanna try to make that diagnosis. And in this instance, especially the diagnosis of HP, removing the exposure matters. So if you had a BAL and we don't know what's gonna, that was really highly suggestive for HP, that would significantly change how you might approach this case. And that's an ex ex excellent point for for including the BAL, which you wouldn't get with the surgical lung biopsy. So yeah. what ended up happening in this case is we went for the bronchoscopy and the histopathology was non-diagnostic, but we do have the BAL results and we do include references for normal and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So we know that typically macrophages are usually around 85% in normal lung and there's a huge range for IPF. We're looking for eosinophils, and in the I think above 25% would be consistent with uh, acute or chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. When you have a predominant neutrophilic picture, well above 50%, you start to think of acute lung injury or aspiration or infection. And then a, a lymphocytic picture defined as greater than 15%, but higher would be suggestive of HP or NSIP, particularly when you're above 25%. Sarcoid is thrown in there, but when you're above 50%, you really start to think of HP and NSIP. And this is the results that you had a 5% lymphocytes, but pretty, sim pretty similar to the spectrum that you would might find in normal or IPF. The genomic classifier in this case was positive for UIP. Sorry about that. So given his age, the imaging, the BAL results, this does not exclude HP, but it's not suggestive. The UIP is increasing the likelihood that if we went for a surgical lung biopsy, we might see a histopathology consistent with UIP. But in this clinical scenario, we felt that it was sufficient to come up with a working diagnosis of IPF. We did start treatment with an antifibrotic. This was in full agreement with the patient who wanted to know, but was comfortable with this level of workup and was interested in therapy. Rebecca, what are your thoughts at this point? No, I, I think that this is a good case. It um in and back to like our polling questions, it could have been a very reasonable scenario as well. 
if the patient was not interested in a procedure, was not interested in taking any medications or thinking about medications to do very close monitoring and watchful waiting. So sometimes in these cases, we will also say, you know, let's, I'm worried about this. It's very early, but we need to follow closely, but I would not feel comfortable following more than three months out. Um, do you have thoughts about that, Matt? Yeah. And I just say, I, you know, I, I think this is such a unique case. Cause I just can't, I think to your point, I can't think of a case that we worked up in this way with such an early, uh, early disease. You know, do we really know what's going to happen to him in the next three to six, six to 12 months? We don't. Um, and that's part of the uncertainty in this field too. You know, do you, you don't want to wait until someone progresses and you're taking somewhat of a chance but there's the the evidence at this point is is increasing likelihood that this might be IPF and uh, it led to a decision a management change very comfortable with. Yeah, and I think that the other key point is a lot of these decisions are shared decisions between um, you and your patient after a discussion of risk and benefit. So this requires, especially this case illustrates that a dialogue is required. But interesting case. We're going to go on to. Uh... Okay. Bill, can you mute yourself? Do you think? Sorry, it keeps coming up. Sorry. Okay. So um, uh, let's move on to this next case, Matt, and we can see what we can learn from this one. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is a case of an 80 year old man who presents to clinic for progressive shortness of breath over the last year. He um, went to his cardiologist as often many patients do. They see several doctors before they come to see us in an interstitial lung disease clinic. And he had hypoxemia on a stress test. He does have a history of COPD and reflux, hypothyroidism and coronary disease. His symptoms, again, the short, shortness of breath and the dry cough, this is exceedingly nonspecific. Many of our patients with interstitial lung disease present with the same complaint, but we can see that in COPD or heart failure, but he also has dry eyes and dry mouth. And granted, we live in Colorado and everyone seems to have dry eyes and dry mouth, but at least when people talk to me about that, we discuss that I tend to think about Sjogren's disease and underlying autoimmunity. Um, he's a former smoker. And we did a detailed exposure history, he doesn't have any exposures that would suggest um, something like hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, no family history of lung disease. And on exam, he does have those mild inspiratory crackles at the bases. And that really piques my interest because now I'm concerned about interstitial lung disease as a cause of his dry cough and shortness of breath. Um, and he has a little bit of lower extremity edema. So as part of our initial evaluation, um, we get pulmonary physiology and his FEC is within normal limits. When we look in the FEC, it's generally between 80 and 120 is um, considered normal. He does not have evidence of airflow limitation uh, and his DLCO is um, a little bit low here at 73% predicted. Normal is um, generally in the range of 80 to 120 um, percent. So someone with well-preserved kind of FEC, um, but a little bit low in the DLCO. Then we're going to investigate, okay, we think we have interstitial lung disease. We definitely want to think about those three main categories as this um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, um, autoimmune related lung disease or potentially hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, and so we got labs and he had an elevated ANA um, and a positive row 52, again, um, concerning for autoimmunity. Because we were thinking Sjogren's, we got a Schirmer's test to kind of objectively quantify the degree of dry eyes. And that ended up being negative, interestingly. And he also went to a joint ultrasound to look for evidence of synovitis, which was negative. We can see his uh, CT imaging here, several different slices. Um, and the most notable thing is this kind of mild interstitial abnormality reticulation kind of creeping in at the bases. Um, and we had a conversation uh, kind of like Matt did in his first case. We talked about hot or a little bit. We're worried about interstitial lung disease. Um, I don't have a diagnosis at this point. It could be idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis very early. I'm concerned about autoimmunity, although we can't identify a definable autoimmune condition. 
There's no clear evidence of exposures or hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And after shared decision making, the decision was like, let's reevaluate in three, three months and kind of see what happens. So we bring him back in three months and we end up looking at his pulmonary physiology, which um, is again, unchanged from prior, but we did have a, a repeat CT. And this shows some progression and change here. We see some kind of increase in ground glass, some increase in reticulation. And when our radiologists looked through the whole scan, which we don't have available for us to view, they determined that it was an indeterminate pattern for UIP. So um, mostly due to the increase in ground glass. So our differential remains pretty broad, even though it's an indeterminate pattern, this could still be idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This could um, also be autoimmunity, um, especially given his nonspecific autoimmune features. So um, what we ended up doing is that, um, do we skip too far ahead? Oh, so what we ended up doing is discussing this case in multidisciplinary conference um, because our differential, again, was we were considering IPF autoimmune lung disease and considering hypersensitivity pneumonitis because about 30% of the time we don't have a known exposure. So we discussed a multidisciplinary conference and we decided to pursue a bronchoscopy. So when we look at the results of his lavage, the most interesting thing here is that his lymphocyte percentage is 89%. This is very high, right? And, and his, um, so suggestive that something is going on here, whether it could be autoimmune disease or pretend, even potentially hypersensitivity and pneumonitis. And then we look at um, the transbronchial biopsies in this case. They did not demonstrate clear evidence of hypersensitivity and pneumonitis, no um, granulomas or anything like that identified. And we ran the genomic classifiers actually negative for UIP. So Matt, do you feel like if we discuss this in multidisciplinary conference that we actually have a clear diagnosis here? like a high confident diagnosis? So you have some characteristics, but you don't have a diagnosis. I think the what you do have is lymphocytosis is, is not consistent with IPF. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there's two features here that are kind of pointing us away from a diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis at this time. We have a negative genomic classifier. We have lymphocytosis on bronchoscopy. Um, and so as we think about this and we think about interstitial lung disease as like fibrotic drivers of lung disease, such as in IPF or inflammatory drivers, um, such as things like autoimmunity, that this would more fall into the drivers of fibrosis under the um, autoimmunity or inflammatory side of things driving fibrosis. And so when we talk to the patient, it would certainly be reasonable. I, I don't have an autoimmune diagnosis here, don't have a clear diagnosis. It is reasonable in this case to discuss, should we move forward with surgical lung biopsy? But we ended up um, also discussing a multidisciplinary con conference. Another approach could be to say, you know, we believe that this is, this is consistent with an inflammatory driver of autoimmunity in interstitial lung disease, we often live in the gray area. We don't have a, a clear diagnosis, but we are pretty confident that the best next step would be to at least consider uh, immunomodulatory therapy. So um, if, if you are sitting here with the same data that we had, what would you do next? Rebecca, that's a tough one. I know that's, they're not meant to be easy. ILD is never easy. So let's see what people think they want to do. So the poll is now live in Slido. Right. So it looks like we have 66% uh, of people would do uh, some form of antigen identification at oral corticosteroids. 15% uh, say non-steroidal immunosuppressants and um, the... Uh, 25% uh, say discuss at MDD. Those don't all add up to 100 because the numbers are changing as people are entering uh, entering their polls. But um, uh, I think uh, some combination of MDD uh, and therapy uh, would be appropriate. Uh, Dr. Kosler, Dr. Keith, what do you think of the results there? 
So I definitely, we, a hundred percent, we talked about this case in multidisciplinary conference and not just once we've talked about it several times. We talked about it before we went to a procedure. We talked about it after we had the results of the bronchoscopy and uh, genomic classifier. Um, I think antigen identification is an interesting thought, right? Um, our CT is not consistent with hypersensitivity pneumonitis, but it is an interesting idea. I think the problem with, um, some of the hypersensitivity panels is that it's neither sensitive nor specific. So I'm, I'm not sure that if I had a positive result there, I would, it would convince me this was HP, um, and a negative result maybe wouldn't convince me it wouldn't, it wasn't. Um, but in the end, I think we all agree from kind of the results that this is in, this lives in the, um, kind of the inflammatory drivers of fibrosis space. And that some form of immunomodulatory therapy, either with corticosteroids up front or a, a steroid sparing agent for the long term, is appropriate in this situation to consider. If your patient is not, some patients might be, I need to know no matter what, I am not doing, I'm not going to consider treatment unless I have a diagnosis. And then in some cases, surgical lung biopsy would be appropriate. Matt, what do you think about in this scenario? I think it's interesting. So, Bill, did no one choose cryobiopsy? One person, maybe. Actually, oh, here you go. Oh, there they they did. Um, yeah, eighteen percent of people chose cryobiopsy. I think the uh, choice for antifibrotic is is interesting because we're we have some progression. Basically, we have a CAT scan with new findings. But I'm not sure that that would be that would be my choice, because we're missing potentially missing uh, a possibility to make this person improve. I think the antigen identification, oral corticosteroids, non-steroidal immunosuppressants—they're kind of in some ways one and the same. In terms of, if you had a granuloma, would you look harder? You know, maybe, but you really still need to come back and say this is a a BAL with a very high lymphocyte, lymphocyte uh, prompt predominance. And that differential really starts to limit you to NSIP, underlying connective tissue disease that may not be present at the moment, or HP. So I, I never know what to deal with, to how to handle this idea of if I had a granuloma, would I look harder? Maybe, but I really want to train myself to look hard anyway. The cryobiopsy, I wonder why people would choose that because it's very possible that you might get a granuloma, granulomatous features on that cryobiopsy that you missed on the forceps transbronchial biopsy. And so it comes back to that question, of, is that impacting your history? Perhaps. And then discuss at NVD is certainly there. I think the difference between oral corticosteroids and non-steroidal immunosuppressants a lot of times we discuss this, whether the oral steroids are going to give you a quicker answer, but a lot of times that depends on comorbidities or whether that patient can tolerate that or uh, that oral corticosteroid um, and how quickly we want some response about whether we're in the right direction. Yeah. So I think in this situation, um, you know, I think it's appropriate. Um, what we decided was that given that he had some, um, autoimmune uh, antibodies that were positive and no evidence of any exposures. And we had him go through his house. We had it inspected. There are no clear exposures that we felt uh, relatively confident, at least in a diagnosis that this was consistent with autoimmune features. Can I say with hundred percent certainty that if we went to surgical lung biopsy, there wouldn't be hypersensitivity pneumonitis. No, but I think that given the preponderance of evidence that we thought that this was more consistent with autoimmune features. What I, we did feel pretty confident about is that this um, was inconsistent with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, that because of the alveolar lavage and because of the genomic classifier, we felt that um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in this scenario was much less likely. Um, given his comorbidities and, um, and just general preferences, we did end up treating him with mycophenolate um, because we were planning on a longer term therapy 
Um, and then we followed him both clinically and radiographically over the, ne the next um, subsequent year. Our practice is generally to follow people at three month intervals to see how um, they do. And when we did that, um, he ended up um, being stable and um, actually having some clinical and radiographic improvement. So let's move on in the interest of time to the next case. Um, and then we can kind of, yeah. Just to clarify, so the, just for our audience, the clinical follow-up, how are you doing that? So lung functions at three months and when are you getting a CAT scan? So in general, when I'm following my patients, especially in the first year, I tend to get um, pulmonary physiology, definitely an FEC and a DLCO and an ambulatory oxygen assessment um, at three month intervals. I tend to save um, high resolution chest CTs for um, once a year, or if there's a change in FBC. Um, although this, this case, this gentleman ended up getting a CT earlier, um, but that is atypical. All right, so let's go on to this next case. So this is a 61 year old woman um, who was referred to our interstitial lung disease clinic for worsening lung function. She had been followed for three years for COPD and emphysema. Um, she has coronary disease and reflux. She's a former smoker. So in um, contrast to our other case, she does have some significant exposures for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. She has a swamp cooler in her home. This is kind of like a um, we see this a lot in the West where the climate is drier. It's, um, it's kind of a waterborne evaporative cooling system, but it can grow mold. And then that can um, be an exposure for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. She also has some silica exposure from doing pottery work. And she frequently uses her outdoor hot tub, another potential um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis um, exposure. She has no family history of lung disease. And then when we check her lab, she has a slightly positive CCP. So now I'm not just worried about hypersensitivity pneumonitis. I'm also worried about connective tissue disease or um, rheumatoid arthritis. But on exam, she has no features consistent with rheumatoid arthritis or other connective tissue disease. So no synovitis or anything. Um, her exam is relatively benign um, and she does not desaturate when she walks. So we have her old CT. Remember, she had been being followed for COPD um, in, in some of our other clinics. And so if we look back to her former um, CT, we can now compare her current CT. This is a while ago. Um, and we can see that there are some changes. Here on the right, there's definitely reticulation now where there wasn't any previously. There is some suggestion of some traction bronchiectasis here. Um, and as we kind of scroll down, we can see that in the basis, again, some peripheral reticulation. Um, there's no evidence of clear honeycombing, um, even especially down at the bases. And so when our thoracic radiologists look at it, they um, say that there's mild to moderate fibrosing interstitial pneumonia, but it's in an indeterminate pattern, uh, mostly because of the increased amount of like little bit of haziness in ground class, and that it has um, progressed from earlier CT in, in 2013. We have pulmonary physiology that we can kind of look back over time because she was followed in our clinic, and her FEC has gone from 3.8 liters to 3.6 liters to 3.4 liters, um, and her DLCO has also similarly had some decline. Um, and now when she does a six minute walk, a walk, when we see her, she does desaturate where she didn't before. So Matt, like, would you consider this progressive pulmonary fibrosis? Would you not? This is a pulling question. Let's ask our, let's ask our colleagues, is this progressive pulmonary fibrosis or is this not progressive pulmonary fibrosis? So we have, uh, one third of, uh, uh participants uh, voting yes and two thirds uh, voting no. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. All right, so Matt, do you have thoughts about this? Well, if you wanna stick to the way this was defined was you need two of three characteristics, new symptoms or worsening symptoms, progression on imaging and progression on physiology, even though that physiology is complicated, also imaging, there's the, you know, the inter-observer agreement among radiologists is not good. However, in that case, I think it's pretty clearly progressed. Progression in FEC, you know, you have range of variability, but here you have a few data points where you have 3.8 uh, 
to three six to three six again i mean that's not a big difference and then three three four even the dlco i mean one could argue if you had data in your own lab might fall within the range of variability so yeah, I, mean, I think scenario yeah, because right, I mean, when you think about like how much does the FCC have to decline, we're not seeing those 5% changes in FEC, we're not seeing the 10%. But in someone who has had symptomatic change in radiographic progression, they could meet progress uh, the definition of progression by those two criteria, right? They have change in CT over time um, and symptoms. So I, I think it's interesting to think about. I think reasonable people would disagree on how they would characterize this, but we're certainly very concerned that this is changing over time. I think we can all agree that given symptoms and given CT changes, we're concerned that this is evolving. Would you agree with that, Matt? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I don't have a diagnosis. I'm worried that whatever this is, is getting worse. Um, this could be an atypical appearance of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, drug reaction is something to consider. We ran her med list on pneumotox.com. Did not see anything like um, amiodarone or nitrofurantoin, which may be a trigger for interstitial lung disease. Um, we, I am worried potentially about early connective tissue disease. She has a mildly positive CCP, but that does not make a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. And I am also worried about hypersensitivity pneumonitis because she does have some significant exposures. Um, and so we discussed this at multidisciplinary conference and consideration of bronchoscopy or surgical lung biopsy. And we moved forward with a bronchoscopy. So her alveolar lavage um, here shows, again, um, majority macrophages, which are the healthy cells we normally see in the lung, um, no lymphocytes to suggest uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And when we do our genomic classifier, it is indeed positive for a UIP pattern. Matt, thoughts on this? You know, in, in some ways, there's there's similarity to the first case in which, uh, you know, if there is progression here, it's you're really coming back to that that imaging, but you're potentially we do know that an imaging and a diagnosis of UIP that pattern is more likely to progress, and so now you have a patient who perhaps we're catching at the early stages of progression and opening up a window to, to treatment. The 6% lymphocytes, hard to know what to make of that. She's, you know, this could be a sampling error. You do have fibrotic HP with a UIP pattern that is possible too. Um, you know, I don't know that you disregard those exposures as well. Yeah, no, I think that it's important to mitigate the exposures, but I think seeing 6% lymphocytes even in IPF is certainly within the realm of what we can see in, um, in interstitial lung disease. It's certainly not 20% or 40% or 79% like we saw in the last case. Um, and so one might be left with, okay, so if we were considering this progressive pulmonary fibrosis, why did you even go through this exercise? Why didn't you just start her on an antifibrotic? And do you have an answer for that, Matt? Do you have an well, idea? Yeah, I was going to ask you, Rebecca, so how do you treat this patient? Yeah, so I think in this situation, um, we discussed this case, and because even though there was exposures, it was not clearly, um, there's no clear evidence of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and certainly like not maybe staying out of the hot tub, making sure your swamp cooler pads are cleaned, having someone inspect your home is important, because we should always be thinking about exposures. But short of that, like we can make a clinical consensus diagnosis that this is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, now, if she was needed to know 100% what, what this was, I think, you know, some people just will not tolerate any uncertainty and you could consider a surgical lung biopsy, but that doesn't come without risk. And so after shared decision-making, we decided on a course of antifibrotic and she remained stable um, on that medication. This is, you know, part of our sh shared decision-making. I felt pretty confident in that diagnosis, given the lavage and given the genomic classifier that we could move forward in that way, in the context of the subtle evidence that this was a progressive um, phenotype. I think that the, the, the 
key point for me here is that making the diagnosis matters, right? Because this could have easily been different, right? We could have been sitting here and then on her lavage, she had 40% lymphocytes and, and in the, and on her transbronx, maybe she had some suggestions of granulomas. And then we would have seriously considered alternate therapy, right? This might've been in the more immunomodulatory therapy side. And so if we just kind of said, you know, anything that's changing over time and getting worse is progressive fibrosis without kind of thinking about how inflammatory drivers of lung disease are important too, then um, I think we're doing a disservice to our patients. We have to think about what are the drivers of fibrosis to the best that we can kind of understand. And in this case, the lavage and the genomic classifier were helpful in multidisciplinary discussion to feel confident, more confident about making a clinical consensus diagnosis of IPF. Just, uh, I have a few questions from um, the group uh, chat. <laughs> I've entered them into the Zoom chat also. Uh, one participant was asking about uh, telomere length testing uh, and whether you incorporate that uh, or any other, uh, they mentioned serologic gene testing. Uh, what, uh, what other types of genomic information other than the genomic classifier? I think. So I think that there's a lot of emerging data about thinking about telomere length and how telomere length may influence um, the choice about therapy. Um, I think that that is also falls in the category of shared decision-making. I do not routinely order that um, on my patients um, because I don't feel confident that I understand yet how that information is going to change my management. However, there is, in my opinion, increasing evidence that we should be careful in our consideration of immunomodulatory therapy and those with short tel telomere lengths. Matt, how would you, uh, do you incorporate that regularly into your um, diagnostic evaluation telomere length or turk or ter mutations or genetic testing? So I, <clears throat> I think that in case two, where you do not have a definable connective tissue disease, it seems like it, but you don't have a diagnosis of scleroderma lung disease, where the decision to initiate immunosuppression is a little bit more clear. That's the, that's the case where I worry about, because if that's a fibrotic, and in that case, I guess it's a little bit, I'm, I'm trying to choose a case that best re represents my concern. In that case, you had 80 some, you know, lymphocytes, you know, clearly that sounds like it's NSAP. But in that scenario where it seems like it's autoimmune lung disease, or you really want to treat this patient with immunosuppression, but you don't have a clear diagnosis, particularly of autoimmune disease, I worry about that patient who may have an, a telomere dysfunction and some of the data that's emerging that those patients may do poorly on an immune suppression. But I think it's really early in the game and whether that changes what you do at this point, I'm not sure. But whether you closely watch that patient for uh, progression despite immunosuppression and whether you change now to antifibrotics, you might do that anyway. Uh, but then the question remains, well, do they stay on their immunosuppression? And then it really becomes tricky. So I the, the case I, where I start to think about it. I think that um, the other case where this comes up a lot is in fibrotic HP. Um, where we kind of, we spend a lot of time in our multidisciplinary discussion, kind of thinking about this, discussing whether we think there's a role um, for testing for telomere length, how we feel about immunosuppression. I think the key thing at this point, is I'm not sure there's a preponderance of data to guide us. There's emerging data and we're very watchful for it. But I think whatever decision we make, we are following patients closely. So if we start with immunosuppression in a like a fibrotic HP case, but people are not are progressing despite um, immunomodulatory therapy, we are very quick to reevaluate and consider antifibrotics. We follow people very closely um, to look for ongoing changes over time at those three or six month intervals, um, so that we can kind of be nimble about thinking about is our strategy working? Does it make sense to change our strategy? Um, and if we give the, if we are giving this talk a year from now, we, who knows, we may be routinely um, testing for telomere length, but we are still in the camp that we're waiting to see how the evidence uh, evolves.
Bill? There was a, there was a question in the chat about um, the uh, comprehensiveness of your a hunt for serologic hunt for uh, connective tissue disease. What's your, did you have a standard panel that everyone has to get? Do you repeat them at National Jewish if they've been done elsewhere? So I think that um, in my in my personal approach and reasonable people have differences, I think it also depends on the pattern um, that we see on imaging. So in patients that have evidence of LAP or maybe a pattern of basal or predominant fibrosis or I'm thinking about myositis, I. I may dig even deeper, but routinely I'm looking for the things that we know are highly associated, especially with the UIP patterns or so rheumatoid arthritis, so rheumatoid factor and a CCP, um, systemic sclerosis. So looking at um, an ANA and um, SCL70, and sometimes when I'm highly suspicious and those are negative, we even look a deeper for a systemic sclerosis panel. Um, we do look uh, at myositis panels, not just at Joe one, um, and then, uh, do look SSA and SSB, but remember we're in a tertiary care center too. And so we, um, err on being more comprehensive because patients are usually coming to us after they've seen multiple people. I think if you're, um, the minimum I would say I would feel comfortable doing is probably an ANA, a CCP, um, and, and, uh, perhaps doing an SCL 70, um, but we're generally more comprehensive. Matt, what do you think on that subject? Yeah, I think the only thing I, I have grown to add routinely is a CPK and Adelaide's just yeah. because I, I it's so subtle and I don't want to miss that. Um, but probably that's it as far as a routine. And, and one might argue why routine, they're not complaining of anything. It's kind of a simple test. And uh, sometimes you catch things that you wouldn't have. So we're at the end of our hour. I uh, just have, well, let's close out with one final question. And in the last case, someone asked uh, with the positive CCP, would you consider uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, associated UIP? And would you consider adding immunosuppressive therapy if extra respiratory symptoms of RA develop? Absolutely. So I think that this is something where we need to we need to follow over time because patients, we have all have had cases where we think we have a diagnosis of IPF and then you know, five or six years later, patients end up developing frank synovitis or rheumatoid arthritis. And so if we see a positive CCP and we've done a detailed exam, even we do joint ultrasound to look for um, kind of subtle signs of synovitis, that over time we're continuing to follow these patients. And, and I have had several cases where down the line, people develop frank features of rheumatoid arthritis when we thought this was initially IPF. And so we have to kind of be nimble about thinking about what's happening over time and be open to reconsidering our diagnoses and what might be appropriate management as things evolve. Matt, would you agree with that? Yeah, you got to keep asking your patients. And it's amazing. Some, some patients get used to their symptoms, you know, or they're treating their arthritis with NSAIDs. And, and yeah, I think revisiting these symptoms is really important. But I think the other key piece is that a CCP alone, although it raises your suspicion, does not make a diagnosis of rheumatoid. Um, thanks, Bill. Thank you very much. Uh, just some uh, technical questions in the Q&A that I'll end with. Uh, it is not available from uh, BAL specimens. Uh, you have to do transbronchial biopsies, and it's three to five transbronchial biopsies. The test is right now covered by uh, Medicare in the United States. And Verisite is working to bring it to other parts of the world in the um, in the near term. I uh, hope you've all enjoyed the uh, the session today, and I do want to thank Dr. Keith and Dr. Coslow for sharing their experience and their expertise. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. On behalf of Verisite, I would like to thank you for your participation in today's event. This concludes today's stream. Thank you, and have a great day.